want to welcome those that are tuning in, joining us online. I realize it takes a few minutes for it to get on everybody's channel, but we're glad to have you join us. We're glad that those that are here in the hotel room with us, it's the sanctuary of God when we're here worshiping. You know, it, it's kind of amazing, if I can just take a minute to share this. Somebody asked me, so, well, what's it like worshiping God in church? Well, I worship him in my yard. That becomes God's sanctuary when I'm worshiping him there. I remember years ago when uh, Church of God, my former denomination, we had our own campground in the state, and we sold it, and people said, well, we can't worship there. Well, why not? Well, one time, literally, on Saturday night, they emptied out a circus that was in that same building. Sunday morning, we were worshiping God there. Does it really matter? It's where we choose to worship. The Spirit of God dwells in us. That's what we've been talking about. We're going to talk about this a little bit later on. So this motel room becomes the sanctuary of God when we're here worshiping God. And wherever you are, if you're worshiping God with us and listening to his word, that is his place too. Amen. Amen. I, I, I shared last week preaching on the anointing, and I said I was going to preach on Psalm 91. And as I began preparing for that, I thought I was going to go there this week, but the Lord just took me another direction. I am going to get there. I had no idea that this was going to become a series of sermons uh, talking about the anointing and walking in the anointing of God. And let me say this again in case you weren't here last week or you didn't tune in with us online. The anointing is not just for the preacher. The anointing is not just for the singer. It is for every born-again believer. God's anointing is for you, and we need to learn how to walk in that anointing. And I want to talk today about standing in his presence because it's when you stand in his presence on a regular basis, should I say, add to that, as you stand in his presence, you're going to be changed and empowered for service. I want to look at a very, very familiar passage. We've all heard it. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning with verse number 1. And I don't usually read this many verses, but I, I want to read this today because I think it's important. Let me give you a little bit of background in case you don't remember the story. In the 18th chapter, I, I call it the showdown on Mount Carmel. That Elijah has come back after there's been a period of three years with no rain. Remember, he prophesied there would be no rain. And he's come back now and said that the rain is going to come. And the king meets him out there and calls him a troublemaker. And they're going to decide who God is, whether it's Baal, their God, or it's Jehovah God, the God that we serve. And the prophets of Baal had done their thing, built the altar, and they prayed all day long. And if you go back and read the passage, it talks about how they cut themselves, they danced, they did all kinds of things, begging, but nothing happened. And then Elijah prayed just a short little prayer, 63 words, and the fire of God fell consume not only the sacrifice, but the wood, the altar, and the water around it. Right after that, we find this. Same day, same sequence of events. It has just happened, and we're going to start with this. Ahab told Jezebel, Jezebel all that Elijah had done, and that he had killed all of the prophets with the sword. And Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I do not make your life like one of them by this time tomorrow. Let me just tell you what she's saying there. She said, I'm going to kill you. Now remember, this guy has just prayed down fire from heaven. He has just slain all the prophets of Baal. And this woman, Jezebel, threatens him. And verse 3 says, And he saw and arose and went for his life. Fear gripped him. We've talked a lot about fear. But I want you to understand, you're not alone when you deal with fear. It's throughout the word of God. People have dealt with fear. And God gives us instruction on that. And he saw and he arose and he went for his life. And he came to Beersheba of Judah. And he left his servant there. And he went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he begged for his life that he might die. I want you to get this. He's just prayed down fire from heaven, consumed the sacrifice, the altar, all the water. And the Holy Ghost has empowered him to slay all these prophets. 
And now he's laying under a tree saying, kill me, Lord. Uh, it'd be easy to sit back and point a finger at him, but I guarantee you, we've all been there. One of my good friends, his wife actually, just posted something on Facebook about an hour ago. And she was talking about how that sometimes she feels so helpless, so alone, and feels fearful. And I said, we've all been there. Whether we want to admit it or not, we have all been at that place where all faith just disappears for a minute. Maybe for quite some time. And here we find the prophet of God in the same boat that we've been in. And he laid down, verse number 5, and he laid down and slept under a broom tree. Behold, then an angel touched him and said to him, Arise, eat. And he looked and beheld a cake was baked on the coals, and a jug of water was at his head, and he ate and drank, and he lay down again. And the angel of Jehovah came him a second time and touched him and said, Arise, eat, because the journey is too great for you. I want you to notice this. God's not condemning him, and he's not condemning you. That's just kind of a side note, but somebody needs to hear this. I don't know if you're in this room or you're watching online, but you need to hear this. God is not condemning you when you're in that place. I won't call her name, but my friend, if you're watching, I know they generally watch every Sunday night. God's not condemning you where you're at. I know you've been in the ministry. I know you've been in all the same places I've been. And right now the devil's beating you over the head. And not just her, but so many others. God is not condemning you. He wants to minister to you. That's what happens here. The angel of the Lord comes and ministers, not once, but twice, and says, this journey's just too much for you. You need the ministry of the Holy Ghost for you. Verse number 8 says that he arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food for 40 days and 40 nights to Mount Horeb, the mountain of God. And he came there to a cave and stayed there. And behold, the word of Jehovah came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for God, the God of hosts. For the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and have slain your prophets with a sword, and I, I alone, am left. Anybody else ever felt like you're the only one left? Like, nobody around you cares, nobody else has any faith, and you think, why am I bothering? This is where Elijah was at. And again, don't forget who he was. And verse number 11 says, And he said, Go forth and stand on the mountain before Jehovah. And behold, Jehovah passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before Jehovah. But Jehovah was not in the wind, and after the wind was an earthquake, but Jehovah was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake was a fire, but Jehovah was not in the fire. And after the fire was a still, small voice. And it happened when Elijah heard he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood at the cave entrance. And behold, a voice to him came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he repeats himself. He said, I have been very zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, because the sons of Israel have forsaken your covenant, have thrown down your altars, and have slain your prophets with the sword. And I, I alone, am left. And they seek to take my life away. Anybody willing to admit you've been to the place where Elijah's at? Feeling like you're all alone. You know, I, I, listen, we're lying to ourselves if we won't admit it. Because whether we want to admit it, we have all been to that place and thought, what's the use? I, I'm trying, Lord. I, I, I've given it my best. I've done all these great things for you, and still I'm hurting. I'm still feeling alone, and I'm afraid of what is surrounding me right now. It may be a physical threat. It may be something that has happened psychologically. It may be any number of things, but we've all been to that place. Elijah, remember, has done great things for the Lord many, many times, but just now, 41 days before, He's prayed down fire, and he's seen this miraculous thing happen. And now he's like, Lord, just, I just want to die. I just don't want to go on anymore. 
And in the midst of all this, God comes to him with a message. The point is this. I don't care who you are, young, old, in between, male, female, preacher, lay person, who you are. We have all been to the place where we feel like even God has forgotten us. That, that's hard to say. But if we get honest, we have been to that place where we think, Lord, you've just forgotten all about me. So I'm done. I'm just ready to quit. I just want to throw in a towel. Just kill me now. All it took was a threat from a woman. By this time tomorrow, I'm going to kill you. Now you stop with me and think about this. I never thought about this too. Just now as I said this. It's now been 41 days. And he's still afraid of a threat that she said, by this time tomorrow. He isn't dead. But a threat can affect us that deeply. Again, whether it's a real threat, an emotional threat, or something we just fear. God was with them against 450 prophets. But now he's fleeing for his life because of a threat. At his lowest point, Elijah is laying there wanting to die, and God gives him a word. It's my prayer tonight. Whether you're in this room, whether you're watching us online, if you see this later on down the road, you know, it's amazing how many times I get messages from people who saw these months later. Listen, the word is still, God's word is always anointed. Whether you hear it live or you hear it a year from now, it's still anointed. And it doesn't matter who speaks it. It could be a donkey speaking it. And I, I love that because God's word always reaches us, reaches us at the point that we need it. Amen. It's my prayer that through this message, my God will give us each word. If you're frustrated, God's got a word for you. If you're confused, you just don't know which way to turn, God's got a word for you. If you're angry, listen, let's be honest. Sometimes we come to church or we tune in online, and we're angry inside. And we're, we're ready. Like, if I don't hear something from you tonight, God, I'm done. I've been there. I've gone to services as a pastor, gone to places. The Lord, if you don't speak to me tonight, don't, don't ever give God that ultimatum. <laughs> but I've said it, Lord, if you don't speak to me tonight, I'm just going to go home and I'm going to resign my church. I just quit. Just like Elijah, we all reach those places. Maybe you're feeling hopeless. Maybe you're feeling alone or battling depression or you've been fearful over the COVID situation or the economy and the things that are happening. I, I've had several times this week alone where people said, I don't know how I'm going to survive if prices keep going up. I understand. I've been there. And I know what it's like to deal with those things. You need to hear not from me, and you don't need to hear from the president. You need to hear from God. You need to hear what God's got to say. No matter what your problem is, no matter what you're contending with or fighting with, God's got a word for you. I want you to hear this. That one word can restore your faith. That one word can restore your joy. One of the things I love about this story, there's so many aspects of it I love, but one of the things I love is when the angel came and prepared the meal for him the second time, according to what I read, he went 40 days and didn't eat again. And I think there's something that God is saying is, you don't necessarily need a word every day. I, I'm going to dispel something right now. People are signed up on things on Facebook. and listen, I don't guess there's a problem with it. But you need to build your faith. If you need somebody to speak a word in your life every day, you need to learn how to get that word from God yourself. Right. You don't need to go to somebody who's trying to sell it to you. I, I watched a guy last night that it literally turned my stomach when I saw it. He had a... A word, a prophetic word. And then when you clicked on it, it says you can subscribe to my word for $5 a week. <laughs> Click. Don't you fall for that kind of nonsense because he's selling the same word to everybody else. Right. God's got something to say, all right, but he wants to say it to you. And you don't need a word every single day because when Elijah got what he needed from God, he went from the strength of that one word, in this case it was a meal, but for 40 days, it was enough to sustain him. I said it last week. I'll say it again. If you haven't heard from God today, whatever he told you last, keep doing it. Because whatever he told you before, that's the continuing marching orders till he changes the direction for you. Don't think you've got to have a word every day. 
Got a, a, somebody I dearly love. I, I, I'm telling you, I love this person dearly. But they get me so frustrated because they're like, Pastor, would you pray for me? I just need a word from God. I'm like, what did he speak to you last time? And I've said this to them so many times over the years. What did he last say to you? Well, I need a new word. No, you don't. You want a new word. You want to change. You want to, you want to go a different direction. But he's already told you what you need. Until he changes it, hold on to what he's already told you. Elijah got one word, and it sustained him for the next 40 days. Oh, help me, Lord Jesus. That one word can make the difference of whether you throw in the towel and quit or you become energized. The choice is yours. God can only give you the word. What you do with it, that's up to you. What are you going to do? Are you determined to quit? I'm telling you, some people are absolutely determined to quit. And I don't care how much you pray for them, how much you fast over them, how many times you go see them, they're going to do what they want to do. It's up to you to do what you want to do. You have to decide who's in control of your life. Is God really in control? Are you at the whim of Satan? It's really your choice. You decide. When the devil comes throwing his challenges at you, you just say, no, no. God told me I'll never leave you nor forsake you. God told me I will always be your provider. And you stand on those promises. And when Satan, like the big bad wolf in the big story, he comes knocking at our door and huffing and puffing. And a lot of people cower down in fear. But you need to say, my God has told me that I am covered. Who's in control of your life? You will never find answers, hear me, for spiritual things until you're looking to God for the answer. I posted the scripture earlier this morning online. It's that so many people don't get this. You are never going to understand spiritual matters until you approach them in a spiritual way. So many Christian people, and certainly in the world, but even Christian people want to take a word from God and then look at the filter of the world to decide what God is doing. You cannot do that. When God says it, bank on it, honey. That's God and his word. How did Elijah get the answer he needed? And this is what I want to get to today. He had to get in the presence of God. Right. When he got in the presence of God, notice this. God asked him, what are you doing here? I've been preaching a long, long time, but I never read that question quite the way I did this week. He's come now, journeyed now for 41 days, seeking God. And he gets there, and the prophet, or God speaks to the prophet and says, what are you doing here? And I really believe what God was saying is, do you just want another touch? Or are you looking for answers? And the answers aren't always going to come the way we thought, because especially we Pentecostal folks, God surely was in that wind, right? right. Or surely he was in the earthquake. Or surely he's in the whole place trembling. But God is in none of those things. It's not saying God isn't in those things ever. You, until you know the voice of God, if you get nothing else I say to this afternoon, get this. Until you know the voice of God, none of the rest of it's going to hold up. Right. That's why I have a problem with seeking a prophet's voice all the time. I'm sorry. I've been there, done that, had prophets come to my church. I believe in the prophetic. But I watched people. They they run from one church to another church to another church to another church. Got to hear the word from the prophet. That is not what God designed the prophetic for. Amen. If you read the word of God, signs and wonders are for the unbeliever. Right. The believer ought to be able to go to God yourself. You ought to be able to go there. I'm not saying a prophet is never going to give you a word. That's Don't hear me that way because that's not what I mean. But if you need to chase after prophets to get a word, what you're telling me is you're too weak and too shallow to get in God's presence for yourself. Come on. Hello, I'm going to amen myself. Come on. See, the answer.
solution to our problem is going to be found when we know how to get in the presence of God. You see, God was saying to Elijah, the Holy Spirit is not the wind. That's just symbolic. He's not the shaking. He's not water. Throughout the word of God, it is used as a symbol of the Holy Spirit. That the water represents the Holy Spirit. But water is not the Holy Spirit. It's a symbol. He's not fire, even though it symbolizes that throughout the word of God. He can cleanse you. He can purify you like that water and that fire can. But don't mistake God for that tangible water. I've seen people take a bottle of water and throw it on people and say, receive the Holy Spirit. That's theatrics. That water, listen, I don't know where it comes from. I bought it at Menards. But there's nothing in there but water. That's not God. It can symbolize God. What I'm trying to tell you is we have bought into theatrics. I'm sorry. I watched a guy this morning on TikTok. I know a lot of people can't stand TikTok, but I'm going to talk about TikTok for just a second. I watched a guy, and he was so dead on the money. He said so many people think that if it's not theatrical, if the preacher's not loud, and if he's not stomping and spitting, then the anointing's not there. You don't understand the anointing. Come on. One of the most anointed services I have ever been in in my life was a young teenage boy, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be insulting, it is what it is. He was young, and like many teenage kids, had pimples all over his face. He, his hair was rather greasy looking, and that was before it was in style to wear your hair greasy looking, and he stuttered. I'm telling you, he stuttered so bad, it was almost painful to try to listen to him. And I sat there, and I listened to him, and, I, and I'm a preacher at this point, and I'm listening, I had a hard time. But all of a sudden, he closed his Bible at the close of his service, and he bowed his head and began to pray, and the power of the Holy Ghost hit that place, and people were slain from the front to the back. There was people saved that night. There was people healed. The point is this. It's not the messenger. Come on. If you don't get that, you're going to struggle in your Christian walk. God used a donkey one time to speak. Right. He does, it's not the messenger. It's not the $3,000 suit. It's not the great TV sets that they have around them. But we think that's the anointing. The anointing is a heart that is pure and goes before God and seeks God to hear what he's got to say. God speaks to him and says, what are you doing here? Did you just come for another touch? Did you just come to feel that Holy Ghost electricity run up and down your spine? Or did you come to fellowship with me? Right. People have misunderstood this for so long. I thank God that we serve a God that I can feel. I thank God. I've been in many, many of those services where the power of God is so real that you can just almost cut it with a knife. It's so thick in the place. But that alone does not mean God. It's the getting in his presence where we stop hiding. Let's go back and look at that story. I'm going to break it down for just a minute. When he got afraid of what Jezebel had to say, he ran. Not only did he run, though, he had his servant with him, and then he told his servant, you stay here, and he went off. One of the first things that happens is we isolate ourselves from the people we need to be around. And then he goes in and he lays down underneath a tree. And I, I never saw this to the other day. I was telling my wife, when the angel come to minister to him, again, he's not condemning, but he tells him, get up. You can't lay there. You've got to get up. Twice, he tells him, get up. That sustains him. God anoints him and sustains him for another 40 days. And he goes out. But again, we find him in a cave laying down. And God says, what are you doing here? Get up from where you are and go out and stand. Ephesians 6 tells us all about the armor of God. And once we put on the entire armor, he says, and having done all, lay down under a tree. 
Lay down on the couch. No. He said, having done all, stand. There's something about standing. If I go back to early days of my life, I, I, I was not all that tough, but I thought I was tough, Bob. I really did. I was, you, you'd have to know, I mean, I, 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 I'm kind of a strange story. I Physically, I grew four inches after I graduated high school. When I was 22 years old, I weighed 138 pounds. And that was after being clean off of drugs for about four months. I don't know what I weighed before then. All of a sudden, when I got off the drugs and I had grown, all of a sudden I put on, literally, I put on 100 pounds. I, I, but my point is, I want you to picture what I looked like before. If you ever care to look, look on my Facebook, you'll find some pictures. I was so skinny, I had wrinkles at 19 years old around my eyes, worse than I have now at 63 years old. But I thought I was tough. And I, I wouldn't back down from a fight, but I remember this. People would come in and start mouthing off. Or, the other way around, I'd go in and mouth off. But when they stood up, you knew it was action time. As long as they were sitting there, or they knew as long as I was sitting there, no problem here. God said, stand. Come on. Get up from where you are and stand. Go, he told the prophet, go out and stand. Interesting thing, and this is the part I never saw before. Even though he told him to go out there and stand, he evidently didn't go all the way out. Go back and check me out. Read that uh, 1 Kings chapter 19 again, and you'll find that he went there, but he didn't go out until God said to him in that still, small voice. Then the presence of God became so real that he had to wrap his face in his garment because the glory of the Lord was so strong. The problem for so many of us, and I'm, I'm probably going to make some people mad when I say this, there comes a point in time even talking with God. I believe physically, but certainly in a figurative sense, you got to stand up. You can't keep laying there, oh God, I've done the best I can. That's what he was doing. Lord, I've done all this stuff, and I've done great things for you, and I've done, and I've done, and I've done, and now I'm all alone. And God says, what are you doing here? Get up. Can I say it the way we would say it today? Get off your pity pie. God's not being harsh. He's just trying to sometimes tell us like we need to hear it. There comes a point in time he said, wait a minute. This is not just a church I'm going to. This is not just some other prophet that's selling his prophecies online. I'm talking to God now. And I need to stand up because he's got something to say to me. And what he's got to say to me, it will sustain me. God's looking for people who will stop hiding in the cave. Get what happened here. The angel of the Lord comes and ministers to him once, ministers to him again. It says this journey is too hard for you. And it sustains him for 40 days, but after 40 days, we find him hiding in a cave again. And here I see a snapshot of so many people in the church today. If they don't get a new word, they go hiding. They got to go someplace and get alone. They, they start getting depressed. I need something new from God. You got to get to the place to know this. If God never spoke to me again, and I'm, talk, and I'm not talking about an audible voice. I'm talking about the spirit-to-spirit -spirit connection. If God never spoke to me again, I'm good. Because it's all right here. Right, right. Everything I need is right here. When you need a word from God, quit running from church to church, prophet to prophet, revival to revival, and get your nose in the word of God. Stand on the word of God because that is our rock. That is the thing that is going to cause you to be able to stand. God's looking for people who will quit hiding, quit getting into a spiritual depression. And he's looking for people who will stand on the mountain of God. The mountain of God represents his word. Where did the word come? To Moses. On the mountain of God. Where does this come? On the mountain of God. God is trying to tell us, you need to get on the mountain of God. Now, I'm not telling you to go take a journey halfway around the world. I'm telling you, get in the word. Because the more you get into his word, the more you're going to get into his presence. 
Right. His word is his presence. I don't know about anybody else. I can't tell you what anybody else feels. But I'm telling you, there are sometimes I crack open. Oh, let me just say that it is. Sometimes I open the word and it's like it might as well be Scooby Doo. <laughs> because the way I approached it, I, I shared this last week. It bears repeating. If you've never learned this, learn it tonight. Before you start reading the words on this page, listen, that is God's word. It is anointed. But you need to connect to it spiritually, not just with your physical eyes and by physical effort. Every time I read the word of God, I stop and I say, it doesn't have to be a big fancy long prayer, but I say, Lord, this is your word. And I come to your word because I need instruction. I need discipline. I need correction. So Holy Spirit, open my mind to receive what I need from you. You teach me. The Holy, what did Jesus tell his disciples? Remember when they came to him and he told them, I have to leave. He says, it is expedient for you. We don't use the word expedient anymore except for a travel agency. But expedient means the best possible thing. Jesus said, it is the best possible thing for you that I go away. For if I go away, I will pray the Father and he will send another comforter and he will lead you into all truth. The best teacher you will ever find is the Holy Ghost. Amen. So you just pray a simple prayer. You don't have to quote me, but in your own way, Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, whichever you're more comfortable saying, it's the same thing. Teach me. Show me, instruct me. And I'm telling you, after all the years that I've been serving God now, there are times I still open the Bible and I read something and it's like, my wife does it to me all the time. It's, I would, she likes to listen to the, the Bible. Which, by the way, Sylvia, you need to get with her. She wants to connect you with that. I keep forgetting to tell you. She listens to the Bible while she's getting ready in the morning. And she'll come in all the time and say, you got to hear this. She's read the Bible from cover to cover many, many times, and she's listened to it several times over the last few years. But every now and then, it's like something just says, dong, yeah. hits you in a whole new way. That's the Holy Ghost. He's trying to teach you. Well, I've taught you this before, but now let me take you to another level in that. It's kind of like in school. Remember when you first started math? We thought we were doing so good when we could count to ten. And then we could add 2 plus 2 and 4 plus 4. And then all of a sudden, they started bringing the alphabet into it. <laughs> and I'm like, why in the world is the alphabet involved with these numbers? And I questioned it big time back then. But you know what? I finally have an understanding for it. I, I kind of laugh all the time. People say, I've never used algebra in my life. I'm like, you have. You just don't even know what you're doing. Because you've learned something and applied it to your life. But the point is, if they tried to teach you algebra... At six years old, you're not going to get it. And it's the same thing with the Word of God. As we get in the Word of God, God's going to give you what you can digest spiritually and apply into your life today. And then as you grow through that level, he says, now I'm going to throw the alphabet into it. <laughs> and he starts teaching us to grow. And what people don't understand is the more you're in the Word, the more you're going to get in his presence. So many people fail to, admit, they, to get that. They think getting in his presence means when we get to the church and we, listen, let's it's just, it's just say it the way it is. It's a whole lot easier to worship God when you've got 150, 200 people in the room and people start shouting and we all do the same thing. But did it really change your life? Sometimes it does. Don't get me wrong. But until you learn to get in his presence by yourself, you're never going to really appreciate his presence in the mass gathering. It just becomes an emotional experience. God's looking for people who will learn to stand on the mountain of God, who desire to be in his presence. One of my favorite aspects of that story is not even mentioned, but it's there. He keeps saying, and I'm alone. And I believe that's the key. God wants to get us alone. He can't teach us as well in a group setting as he can one-on-one. -on -one. You ever notice this? I, whether it's in a baseball or basketball or sport or whether it's tutoring or whatever it is, I can say this much. I sure learned a lot more with tutors 
that I did in the classroom. I'm not putting down the classroom, but there's something that happens when it's personal. And God can get us in that place, and he speaks to us. In the Old Testament, I don't have to tell you, I hope you know this by now, they carried God around the box. We call it the Ark of the Covenant. That was God's plan at that time. But on the day of Pentecost, it says the fullness of God came. And he anointed the believers. God is saying this, from that point on, I'm not in a box anymore. You can't just say, this is God. I've had people argue with me. God's not in it. God wouldn't talk to you that way. I'm telling you, he does. I've had people argue with me. I've said it when I'm preaching, and I've gotten messages through our website. I've gotten them on the emails and stuff. And people say, God's not going to talk to you in your shower. He will if you listen. He'll talk to you in a boat. He'll talk to you walking down the street. He'll talk to you wherever you listen. The point is, you've got to tune yourself in. I've used this illustration many, many times. In this room right now, if you don't believe it, well, I, I won't do it. Do you know Willie Nelson's here? <laughs> He's singing right now. And so is ACDC. But without a tuner, you're not. God is trying to the Holy Spirit, and you in His presence, where He teaches us to know He. God in that box. He thought I used to be. He was at that time, but things changed. He says, "I want the Spirit to dwell in you." I think a lot of people to get there. talking a while ago about this being God's sanctuary. I'm his sanctuary. It says where two or three are gathered in my name, there because you brought in and I now we're there, we got a connection. I've said lives. I wouldn't want to go to the places I grew up in. I wouldn't go where you grew up in. My blood is it. I don't like it. gave me my way, I would live right in the heart of the city. I love city life. And some of you are like, man, I can't. The Holy Spirit in us connects us. Even though we're as different. And that's why we are gathered. There are seven words that are found in John chapter 7. I talked, I think, hungering and thirsting for God. Getting hungry. Won't even go there again. The point is, you ever hunger for something so bad? Then when you get it, it's just not what you Find what you're really for. I know. I guess there's sometimes you get up from the supper table. Good meal. But both of us say, I'm not satisfied. Only wanting wasn't in that meal. Is a lot of people are trying to with hear me very carefully. I'm really upset. I am not saying there's anything wrong with going to revivals. I'm not wrong with going to we used to call them spirit things. I don't know why we call them that, but hear the thing is going possible thing. But I'm telling you that that is not satisfied. You're lacking in the And 
there's the problem for so many believers. Hunger and thirst for righteousness, for righteousness filled. But then in John 17, he says seven words. He really zero what he says. He, and he says that I myself may be in them. Let this sink in. Jesus is praying and he says that I myself may be in them. Say this over to you. you said, or maybe you've heard somebody say it. You know what we're trying to say, but we don't understand God. People will say this. Oh, I would give anything. You have missed what Jesus was praying here. At that time, Jesus had clothed himself in flesh, and he was at that one time. But when he said, it's expedient for you that I go away and I will pray the Father that the comfort to you, the Holy Spirit can be here and in China at the same time. And the Holy Spirit can do and can be in me. And God is miserable at the same time. That's what Jesus was praying. That I might Christians today live with a pre approach to serving. I can only get to the church. I wouldn't be a pastor. I believe that. I believe that there's coming. Guess what? It's Jesus right where you are. Shower or or the grocery store or wherever you might be. You can encounter. We should be living in a post-apostle. I'm afraid people think I'm trying to say Pentecost. No, but on the day of the church, God communicates. There's another one you need to play over your He chooses to fellowship with us. He desires of the Holy Spirit into our lives. The thing that we are today living in, God doesn't want you to be just empowered when you go to church. He wants you to empowered on Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday. Oh, God forbid, if you this church this week, he still wants you empowered. Right. Because you've been in his presence. House. Not just in the hotel room, but you in his presence. The way so empowered is to go after the anointing. And the only after the anointing is to get in his presence. Let me go back one more look at this and I'm gonna close. The passage there in First Kings 19. Up and stand. He didn't just say stand on the mountain. He said stand in the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is about to pass by. When he's getting ready to move in your life. If you're listening. Stand. Go back to six. I don't have to there tonight. But it put on the shoes of righteousness, the shield of faith, and all the breastplate of righteousness. And we got to do all of these things. Stand. Be, be ready for martyrdom. Be ready to Just that the Spirit of the Lord can get you. Don't you think Gideon But then God anoints us for special service. Just listen. We can only do what God is calling us to do. 
operating. That's why Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. In other words, I've died to myself. And I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life of the body. Ghost could be all of us at the same time. One last thing. God does not have plan B. People say that God backs up and gives plan B. No, no, no. God does not have a plan B. His plan is to fill you, to fill me, to reach this world. Right. That's his plan. Jesus said, I will build my church. We quote this all the time, but I, say, I submit we quote it wrong, or we understand it wrong. He said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail. People act like the gates of hell are coming at you, but you know what, Bob? I've never seen a gate move. Though it might be open and swinging, but no, that's not what it says. The gates of hell will not prevail. In other words, the gates of hell won't stop you. Come on. We, the church, are not supposed to. to hell in a handbasket, we ought to not be sitting back talking about it. We ought to be doing something about it. We ought to be going out there and preaching the gospel and telling people about the Lord Jesus Christ that can change their life. The gates of hell will not be able to stop us Come on. if we're anointed for his service. Come on. Keep this in mind. Some, it's usually not this severe. I've watched one of them, a dear friend, another one of his friends, went to China. I've talked about this publicly before. They were told when they went to China, now if you don't know this, Christianity is banned in China. They were told you cannot go out in the streets. And they got all full of themselves. And they said, ain't nobody going to stop with me. I'm going to go tracks and I'm going to lead people to Jesus Christ. And they ended up in jail. What is it? that one of them is a dear friend of mine. Been a friend for a long, long time. He meant well. But he went on his own. Right. The word of God says, not by might. I've said it this way countless times. You can kick out any door you choose to, but you got to split your hands. Let him open the doors. As he tells you to go, go. But until then, stand. But when you go without him, you've gone in your own power. In your own strength, and we usually make things then. You know the poem, Footprints in the Sand? I'm sure we've all heard it. They did it in a song several years back. Beautiful thing. It really is a beautiful story. But one of my friends a number of years ago, probably about 15 years ago now, said this to me, and at first I thought he was off his rocker. He said, no, it's not biblical now. He said, Daryl, it's a nice poem. He said, we like the idea of Jesus carrying us. But Jesus did not say, I want to carry you. He said, I want to dwell in you. There's a difference. And the problem for a lot of Christians is we're expecting God to carry us when God wants to dwell in us. Amen. That's where the anointing comes in. We get so filled with temptation still going to come not. Jesus is right. 
and says, you're not welcome here. You're still going to have problems come your way. But the spirit dwelling inside of us says, no, you, you don't have a foothold here. You may come and you may afflict them, but you're not going to take root in them because I abide here. The world is crying out for a church that will redeem its inheritance. That's what we're called to do. But the problem is God says, I you move. Come on. Oh, boy, I'd like to go farther, but I've been too long already. I'll pick up on this next week. Here's the question. When I said a while ago at the very beginning, We all have times where the pressure is mounting. That's normal. But the question is, are you going to quit? Response? You lay down underneath that tree and say, Lord, just take my life. And it would be honest, we've all been there. But he condemned me, but he says, don't quit. God has called us all to be soldiers in the army of God. But you've got to be saturated in his presence. It, it, a little bit's not going to work. This is what I, I believe the greatest problem in the body of Christ today is. I'm including myself in this. We set God on the back burner until we need him. I want to be in the forefront. The first thing you feed yourself every day. I want to be the last thing you feed yourself every day. I want my presence to be so real in you that you are my hands and feet in operation in this world. We shouldn't have to. I, I'm going to say it and I'm, gonna, I'm preaching right here to me. We've probably all been in a place. The preacher says, let's all come and we're going to pray over this person here. And on our way there, we're saying, oh, God, forgive me for my sins. Because we weren't ready. We've not been prayed up and in his presence the way we need to. What I'm trying to say is I'm not condemning anybody. I'm telling you what God is trying to get the church to do in these last days is to be so full of his presence that it flows out on you to other people. That's what was happening in the Bible when Peter passed by and his shadow touched somebody and they were filled. I believe that God is no respecter of persons according to his word. And the same thing ought to be happening in our lives if we become that filled with his presence. His presence is the secret to holy living. His presence is the fulfillment in a life for God, live for God. I talked about being in the secret place last week. That's what I'm talking about. Getting it's, it's not like you have a secret place where you have to go to. It, there's nothing wrong with having that secret place. But the secret place is his presence. Get in his presence every day. When I first got saved, I'm so thankful. Somebody said to me, you need to pray every day until the Holy Ghost takes over and prays through you. That's what speaking in tongues is. As we do that, it will transform our life because the Holy Spirit is now leading us rather than waiting for us to take him out like a pocket knife. I'm all close. We've all been in need. Every one of us, we've been in need for more of God. And I'm challenging you, whether you're in this room or whether you're watching online and you may be a pastor yourself, we need to get to the place Flowing out of it, not the wrong thing did over and over. Let the Holy Spirit so energize your life that his presence is felt by the world around us, and then we will make a difference in this kingdom. Let me pray. Father, I thank you for the word. I thank you for the privilege of standing and proclaiming your word to this church, to those that are watching online. Lord, as I've said so many times, I'm preaching to myself tonight. 
Before I talk to anybody else, i got to talk to myself. Lord, help me to be so plugged into you that, Lord, every day I am filled up and overflowing in your anointing. Father, that anointing makes a difference. It is the anointing that breaks the chain of bondage. Lord, let it happen in my life. Let it happen in the lives of those that are here, those that are listening online. But, Lord, it's not going to happen unless we pursue you. And that means we got to get up. And we got to go into your presence. Your presence is not going to come to us. We've got to go to you. Father, change our thinking. Change our approach to ministering. Change our approach to living. That everything we do is done through the anointing of the Holy Ghost. And Father, I give you the thanks. I give you the praise. I thank you because, Lord, I believe you're building a church in these last days that is going to shake this world to its very core. I want to be part of it. Change me, Lord God. I can't speak for anybody else, but change me. Draw me into your presence like I've never been before. And Lord, help me to quit running from it. Help me to quit feeling sorry for myself feeling like I'm alone and isolated, but Lord, to recognize those times to get close to you. Father, be glorified. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you. If you're in the area, come in and be with us next week. We meet every week at 2 o'clock, and if you can't, tune in online. You guys too.